Thanks very much for the introduction, Paul. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you today on the topic of wool and wellbeing and the uh, creation of new markets for Australian wool. Now, it's well understood that people value their health. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the United Nations Millennium Poll, uh, health was rated as the single most important thing. Less clear is whether people link the garments they wear to their health. Uh, certainly, my children, when asked, uh, couldn't see any obvious reason why one fibre type should be any healthier than another. So an important question is whether it's a, a, a coincidence or a fluke um, that nature, over the eons, developed a woolly layer directly next to the skin of sheep and many other animals. Now, is this an example where Darwin's uh, theory of natural selection and survival of the fittest has failed? And clearly it's not. Um, there's been a long history of research into the health benefits of wool. The early research focused on individual attributes, things like thermal insulation, moisture absorption and breathability, and resistance to flame, odour and ultraviolet light. More recently, the researchers looked at broader health areas, improvements to mental health achieved through better sleep, uh, improvements in skin health. And future research will look into improved cognitive and physical performance, particularly for elite activities and elite sports. But today we only have a short time to talk to you on wool and our focus will be on skin health and particularly uh, skin health for uh, eczema sufferers. Now the three key messages we'd like to leave you with at the end of the presentation is firstly that clinically sig significant benefits are being realised by eczema sufferers who wear wool directly next to the skin. Secondly, uh, the skin is often uh, called the, uh, the largest organ in the body and skin health uh, potentially represents a really large market for wool. But it does have to be the right wool. It does have to be superfine wool fabricated into lightweight knitted garments. Now at this point I'd like to introduce uh, you to uh, Professor John Sue from Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Uh, John uh, is the Australian representative on the World uh, Eczema Council um, and uh, he has, uh, will be talking to you on, on a study that he's led uh, assessing wool and eczema. Thank you for, <coughs> for that introduction, Angus, and to all the organisers of the meeting, Paul. I've been very privileged to participate in this study. I'm a paediatric dermatologist and we're often quite divorced from the outer world. So this has been a, a big learning experience for me in terms of re-engaging with the environment. And my work largely is with paediatric atopic dermatitis or eczema. And for those of you who may not be so familiar with this condition, it's um, about 85% of cases begin in the first five years of life and it causes huge impact on the lives of children and families. About maybe 70% are not so severe, but about 30% are moderate and severe disease. And, and the, the problem is that you've got leaky skin and the, the irritants can, can affect the skin and cause inflammation very rapidly. And so we have red, itchy, painful skin. Children can't sleep, the, the, they can't concentrate at work. If they can't sleep, their parents can't as well. And so there's a vicious cycle that perpetuates and compliance with complex treatments that we offer is often very poor. So there's a great outlook now on measures that may help with prevention of disease and to arrest things at a relatively early phase. The, the other complicating thing is that we actually have more of this now than ever. And in a recent Melbourne study, about one in three infants actually have eczema. And at the prevalence in children is about one in five. So that's a large number of children. And if we look at the world scene, we have an increase in the last two decades, particularly in developed countries, but um, also in the Far East, Australia, parts of South America. So it's really a global kind of increase, which is having major impact both on personal health as well as financial issues with trying to treat these children and adults. 
and more so, we have now a better understanding of the way eczema impacts the rest of the body because we've got this leaky skin. Things can penetrate through, including allergens, and we believe that there is this thing called the atopic march where allergens going through and contacting eczema skin in children actually leads to sensitization and the development of sensitive immune systems to things like grass pollens, dust mite, and even foods, so that you get this march of early eczema followed by asthma and allergic rhinitis. And if you add all this up, the cost to the, the health system is huge. So if we can somehow help switch it off or at least reduce it at this very early phase, the impact will be very, very great. So one of the things which was a big mind opener for me was I actually attended a conference and Paul happened to be speaking about the properties of war, the hygroscopic properties, the, the heat transfer and so on, and it was, it was something very, very new to me. And, and, and there is very little study in the, in the dermatology world about these properties. Um, there were a few studies in the 1950s um, where they did, did these rather unusual tests, for example, of soaking wool in, 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 and, and with this moist thing, sticking it on the arm for one week and seeing if it irritated the skin. And I don't think we would call that a very robust study in, in modern terms. So it's had this, I guess, bad reputation for a long time um, based on just these few reports. And so it was time to explore it again. And we did a randomized control trial, which is, I guess, the most robust of cl clinical trial designs, um, where children were allocated into two arms. We had a total of 39 children. 20 started with wool, 19 started with cotton, and then we crossed them over. So the wool wearers ended up wearing cotton, and the cotton wearers ended up wearing wool. And so they could also serve as their own controls as well as comparing the two arms against each other. It was a 12-week study, six week wearing each respective garment, and the children were reviewed every three weeks. And we had to change them over here, which was an interesting thing, because often the, the, ch the children who were wearing the wool didn't want, us to give, didn't want to give the garments back. <laughs> So we, we took them off. We didn't, we didn't go through ethics for that taking phase. Um, all the children had standardized atopic dermatitis therapy, and we tried our best to control for other variables. These are examples of the garments. So for the little ones, they often wore onesies. And for the, the older children, they wore, wore leggings and either shirts or singlet, depending on the weather. And these were, were crafted from a, a producer in Norway, I believe. Um, but it had a very nice feel, and it certainly didn't feel like um, the, the coarse wool that, that we used to think of as being the norm. So these were the outcome measures that we looked at. We looked at a, glo a more general global severity eczema score, but we also looked at a local score, in particular looking at the most severely affected areas, which was definitely underclothing and also quality of life. We also measured the amount of cortisone that was used during the treatment, the treatment period and also the compliance with clothing. Just to make a note that the compliance was actually very high and we had very little attrition bias in the study. And the, the treatment, there was, uh, there was a, a, a quite um, dramatic reduction in the steroid use that corresponded to the outcomes. So we'll first look at the cotton first group. And um, here are the mean values of the score ad over time, the first six weeks. Here they changed over to wool, and here was the second six weeks. This represents the red bar, the 95% confidence intervals, so that we can say that there's a 95% certainty that the real, the real value lies in this range. So if there's no crossing over of confidence intervals, we can be pretty certain that this is a real effect. So what we see here is that there's a sort of a jostling around during the initial phase of, of wear. And then when we change over to the, and this is super fine merino wool um, in, in these three, uh, zero to three year olds, we, we get this quite significant drop that as you can see, is, 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 it does reach statistical significance and is the zone of clinical significance as well. 
Now, if we look at the wool first group, again, you have this sort of slight reduction here, but you know, there's a lot of overlapping. So we're not quite sure why this is not as dramatic as this change here. But yes, there is definitely a downward trend. But then when we change over to, to, to the normal um, uh, uh, cotton wear, there is an, an increase in score. And there is a distinct trend here, which is the inverse of what we're seeing over here. So with, with analysis of these results, we did find that if you lump the, 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 the cotton and wool wear groups together, there was a, a distinct and statistically significant drop in the severity scores, which was in the zone of clinical significance. And likewise, if you look compared each group against each other, we get the same kind of results. And we get the same mirroring of, of um, benefits when we look at the local score as well as quality of life. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Um, so it's really useful to hear from the medical specialist and the researcher who understood the study. But another uh, useful perspective is from the, from the patients. Um, you know, what's happened to their quality of life? And I've just got a short video here um, that was taken by Channel 9 uh, and uh, where they interview one of the mothers of the babies in John's study. Um, sufferers with a new study showing modern merino clothes seem to improve the irritating condition. A Melbourne dermatologist has found children tolerated garments made from the superfine fibre better than cotton. Medical reporter Emily Rice explains. Siblings, two-year-old Ali and four-year-old Blake, both suffer from the dry, itchy skin condition eczema. It was red, painful, blistery, um, like the heat coming off it was unbelievable. But since dressing the toddlers in super fine merino wool, most of their symptoms have disappeared. Within two, three weeks of doing this, it was just unbelievable. The, it, the transformation is, I mean, even now, it's clear. Her skin is clear. They're wearing the winter woolies for a study by dermatologist John Sue. His hospital-based analysis recruited 40 children under age three with eczema. When they switched from wearing cotton to superfine merino wool, their symptoms such as redness, dryness and scratch marks reduced significantly. The skin actually looked better as well as feeling better. Researchers are now investigating if merino wool garments should be prescribed as part of eczema management does show advantages over other fibres. In decades past, the fleece shorn from sheep and knitted into clothing was coarse and prickly. But wool classer Terry Johnston says today's ultra-fine forms of the fibre are far more comfortable. Wool classes, we get to, to handle it every day. It's just soft. It's just beautifully soft. It's a natural product. Modern Australian wool is so fine, it's almost on par with silk in terms of its softness. And it draws moisture away from the body, allowing the skin to breathe in all types of weather. I would 100% recommend it. Um, it's, it's amazing. Emily Rice, Nine News. So um, when uh, John Sue was first approached to assess his interest in undertaking this study, he said uh, on reflection that, that um, he was prepared to buy the hypothesis that wool, because of its moisture buffering ability, may be able to assist his patients. But he said, can you guarantee to me that the garments you provide won't irritate the, my, my patients and cause a flare up in their conditions? And that really was, that discussion really was the origin of the need uh, for a medical specification. Um, now, the, the scientific understanding of, of irritation from garments is fairly well established, and it essentially relates to the hairiness of the surface of the fabric. If there's a sufficient density of coarse protruding fibres from the fabric, then it can be irritable. And it doesn't matter whether the fibre type is wool or polyester or nylon, if that's sufficiently stiff, then it can trigger the nerves below the skin, leading to irritation and itching. And if you happen to be an eczema sufferer, that can lead to a flare-up in all your symptoms. But this is not the case uh, with regard to superfine and ultrafine merino wool, because the fibres here are sufficiently soft and flexible to bend out of the way without triggering the nerves. Now, the medical specification is uh, well progressed. And uh, we hope to, 
to publish the first version by the middle of this year. And then the next stage of that is that the specification will lead to a swing tag that will be placed on garments in shopping centres to help, help inform uh, purchasers to make uh, informed decisions. Um, so if you or if your children, for example, have a sen very uh, sensitive skin and you purchase garments with that swing tag, then you can be guaranteed that it'll be comfortable and won't irritate. So, Moving on to the topic of uh, new markets for Australian wool, and, and Carolyn touched on, on the demand and supply side earlier. Um, it's, it's on, the, on the demand side, uh, it's useful to get the perspective of the, of the brands that uh, sell Merino wool. Um, and uh, I have another short video, this time uh, from the CEO of a Norwegian company uh, called Devold. Uh, they specialise in active outdoor and sportswear and this video was taken two weeks ago at the ISPO conference uh, um, in, uh, in Munich. Uh, it's, it's a sportswear exhibition. We work uh, very closely with our customers and many of the exciting innovations that we work on actually come out of very specific requests from our customers. So for instance, we are working with the um, fire department. We do have a lot of garments that have flame retardant properties uh, and now the uh, fire department wants us to develop something that also has properties in terms of protecting firefighters from the very harmful gases and substances that you typically find in smoke. So wool is a fantastic material to work with in terms of actually finding the properties to protect people, in terms of skin primarily. When it comes to the skin uh, study that's been done in Australia, obviously they've been using our 17 and a half micron a fine merino wool breeze collection for that. And in, in between the skin and this very fine merino fabric, there's this unique microclimate that's being established which then have these significant effects on actually improving skin conditions for kids with eczema. So it's all about understanding all the fantastic properties of the wool and being a wool specialist, having worked with wool for 164 years, we are constantly learning about new miracles of wool that we are able then to actually manufacture and take out in terms of specific products that benefit both customers, whether they are professional industrial customers or private customers. There's a general trend towards finer and finer merino. So we see, for instance, that our 17 and a half micron collection is getting more and more traction with consumers who are adapting that as an all year round alternative. So that, that's one of the very clear trends. We see that there's a move towards finer uh, microns and finer merino. In addition to that, we also see that we are able to expand and evolve the use of merino into new categories. So for instance, we have developed now a collection for the sports or high intensity training segment of the market which is based on 16.5 micron with a mix of 10 cell actually, to give it those sort of training clothes types of properties. So there are new usages for Marina wool in new segments, sport being one of them, lifestyle being another segment that we definitely see that we're getting some traction in. So I think that more and more people will discover the miracles of wool, and more and more people will discover that there's only one thing that deserves to be next to your skin, which is Marina wool. So, um Several times there, uh, it was mentioned about the increasing demand for superfine merino wool. Uh, so let's just have a look at the supply side of the, of the story. So um, if we go back to the uh, early 1990s, that was a particularly tough time for the wool industry. There was an oversupply of wool. We had a stockpile. Uh, prices, prices were consequently down. And wool growers were more or less given the message to get fine or get out of the industry. And by any measure, um, they've delivered on that. The, the availability of superfine and ultrafine wool now is at record levels and currently represents more than a, a quarter of the whole clip. So as a country, Australia is very well placed to service uh, an increasing demand for, for uh, superfine and ultrafine wool. So really, the next steps uh, in this particular area are to publish the papers that have been uh, about the studies that have been undertaken in Australia. There's been two. There's the one John spoke to on babies and young children in Melbourne, and there was another study undertaken in Queensland on adolescents and adults. 
Uh, and just as an aside, um, with the adolescents and adults in Queensland, when, when the, uh, the participation in the study was first put to the patients, I think every single one of them said, no, I, I can't do that, I can't wear wool because I live in Brisbane, which is a hot, humid environment, uh, and it just won't work for me. Uh, and not a single, not a single patient uh, withdrew from that study. Once they started to see the benefits, uh, they, all, they all persisted all the way through. So, uh, and, and John's study, uh, we, in terms of publishing, uh, we always aim for the highest ranking journals, peer-reviewed journals, dermatological journals, that, um, that we can. And, and uh, John's study, for example, has just been accepted by the British Journal of Dermatology for publication. Then we need to get busy on the marketing side to promote this new, newly discovered attribute of wool, um, or, or relevance, I suppose, to, to a particular skin health market. Um, and uh, certainly the Woolmark company uh, and brands like Devold, who specialise in this base layer garments, are already active in that, in that area. And, uh, Lastly, we do need to do more of these studies. We do need to replicate the Australian studies in other, in other markets. Um, sometimes you just don't get traction uh, in other markets uh, until you demonstrate the, the, create the evidence right on their doorstep. So uh, in the last month, we've just initiated a, a similar study to John's uh, in, uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, we're in negotiations about undertaking further studies in uh, China, uh, the UK, and perhaps Germany. Um, so really that uh, brings the presentation to an end. Um, thanks for your time.